He, in the process, is locked in a tower and forgotten. Locked in a tower by Western consciousness, locked in a tower to which we have in many ways lost the keys because we know as modern folk there are no wizards. We know. We know. We have our those skilled in the seven arts, don't we, huh? We've got a few seven archers around here, folks that uh, know all the philosophy and all the science and all the math, but have forgotten, forgotten. Why? This vision and deserts. Well, our own modern imagination, of course, has seen the wizard again find place in the modern psyche. Not that Maryland has ever been dif very distant from us over these last thousand years. He has danced in the psyche of the West in many ways, found many roles. But along comes a modern magician of sorts, a modern bard in the old tradition by the name of John Ronald Ruel Tolkien. And Tolkien was indeed a visionary, a master of the imagination in the same sense as were those old medieval bards, which I might add, he made his own life's study. The man was a philologist, a linguist. And what was his specialty? The legends of Middle English. Hmm? He knew these folks well. And as, he's, as he tells us in his great essay on Beowulf, he felt a deep affinity with the bardic soul of that distant time. The bards, remember, were also the Druids. They were the old legend tellers, the ones with imaginative vision. The visions that constellated into what we know as the Lord of the Ring, the Lord of the Rings began when Tolkien was perhaps an adolescent. He went to the Cornish coast, I think he was about 14, and a poem came to him. It was about one Elendril who sailed across the western seas after a star. He wrote the poem down and he gave it to a dear friend. The friend read it and said, well, you know, that's interesting. But what's it about? <laughs> it's it's a, essentially a vision fragment of a sailor, Elendrin, and a star, and a voyage. That's it. What's it about? And the young Tolkien scratched his head and said, I don't know. I will have to find out. I will have to find out. You see, and that's the difference between Tolkien and Tolkien's experience of the imagination and what some of us consider to be the creative process. If we were to say, well, uh, what's it about? Uh, many of us might think, well, I'll just have to, I'll have to figure something out. Hmm? I'll have to make something up. I'll make something up to go with this. But Tolkien's approach to the unconscious, to the imaginative realm was one of discovery. I will have to find out. I will have to go on an adventure into, a quest into that creative realm. The dear friend to whom Tolkien had given the poem went with him into the Great War, to the Battle of the Sun, and there died, as did one of Tolkien's other dear friends with him, part of the Yorkshire Fusiliers in around 1916, in the great carnage of that war. He went over the top into the machine guns of the German forces, into the barbed wire. But the night before he died, he wrote Tolkien a letter, a short note, saying, indeed, as perhaps only a soldier on the eve of a great battle can say, can know, that he would not return. And he commissioned Tolkien that if indeed he should die, that Tolkien should continue and bring to fact the dreams that they all 
once shared. Tolkien did not die, of course, in the trenches, but he sickened gravely. He started suffering from high fevers. They couldn't figure out the cause. They sent him back to hospitals in England. And thankfully, the mysterious fevers continued day after day, and he sat in bed for about eight months, and he never was sent back to the front. They never figured out why. But every time it would be about ready to discharge him for the hospital and send him back to that battle, his fevers would spike. And in that period, he began to discover languages, tongues, words, words, exhalations of divine breath from an, a realm that he could not quite identify with anything in this world. They came from a land that in later years he called fairy, fairy. They came from the land of fairy and the, the voices, the words were elfin voices. The tongue was an elfin tongue. He began actually to investigate the language first. And in his investigation of the language that he was hearing from his creative imagination, he became interested in the events. He says, really, you know, I, I wasn't setting out to write these stories. I was just trying to figure out who was speaking this language. In the course of 20 years, this is from the 19, late 1916, 18 period up through the early 1930s, <coughs> Tolkien developed two or three full-formed languages. At the same time, of course, he was a professor and ultimately a don at Oxford teaching about Middle English and, and Beowulf and the ancient leg legends of the bards, but he was creating his own language. And <coughs> from that quest of understanding, from that attempt to find out, came a, how could I describe it? An unformed volcanic eruption of creative magma. Myths, one after the other. They are very briefly summarized, redacted into a book called The Silmarillion now put together by his son. But the myths themselves were something he never could get a handle on. He tried, actually, after The Lord of the Rings was published in 1953 or so, for the rest of his life, 20 years, to put a form upon what had, had happened to him, what he had seen, what he had written in those years between 1918-19 and the mid-1930s. And he simply could not do it. They existed rather like the Grail myths themselves, many different visions, many names, many events, and they just simply could not be brought into one corpus, though he might try. At his death, he had literally a garage full of manuscripts of his attempts to write and rewrite and form and combine and somehow make sense of this material. Thousands and thousands and thousands of pages, and his son Christopher, from those, put together a small, small fragment into a book called The Silmarillion now. And so when the Lord of the Rings comes, you have to understand that this, this great work and its wizard are born not freshly to the imagination, but they emanate, shall we say, organically from a 20-year experience of creative imagination, of myth, primary vision, bardic vision. And chief among those figures of that creative imagination is one old fellow we know as Gandalf. Gandalf is name, and so also is name, Grey Wanderer, Grey Haim, Mithandrir, Olorin, because in many languages he had many names. In Tolkien's emanational uh, creation myth, there were a variety of outflowings of the first creative force, known as Iluvatar. From Iluvatar there came the Valar, the first gods, 
And from these gods there came helper spirits, which were known as the Maiar. And in the thousandth year of the third age of Middle Earth, there arrived at the Grey Havens five wizards. The elves knew them as uh, Istari in the elven tongue. Istari, Vaid, Ai, Is, Istare, 